I think, having pressed that button, uh, I think we're actually recording an uh, episode, which is exciting. Um, good evening, everyone uh, in the chat. Hello, hello. It's it's a pre-record because I'm currently... I don't know what I'm doing. I think I'm working my way across the country on a train, so I can't do an episode. But thankfully, um, Jennifer Williams has joined us from uh, the MEN. Gen- Jennifer, where, in fact, I'm going to press a button because I can, we can say hello. In fact, you've resized because uh, I, I was, the, technology, the technology is always <laughs> bouncing around. I can only apologise. Hello. Hello. <laughs> Here we are. Well, I'm going to make myself the right size. That's right. That's yeah, I, I fix. It's all fixed. All the technology is working fine. Um, <laughs> yes, we are going to talk. Oh, this. It's it's such a depressing subject. It'd be nice if we could talk about the positive things that are happening, but it's a depressing subject. But it's an interesting one, I suppose, and it's politically interesting as well as sort of. I, I always rail matter is yes, engineering is fun, but actually, it's the political stuff that gives everything meaning and context. So. Um, Without further ado, I think we'll crack on. I just came. I just Ooh. thought I'd say hello to everyone and let them know that you're here. Um, so, that said, um, we have Jennifer Williams here. We are going to crack on. So, th- this whole episode is really going to be about the IRP, and I'm a f- I fear that quite a lot of real natural episodes are going to be about the IRP coming up. But we're going to be talking about the political context of the IRP, and particularly whether um, whether we, th- it's going to actually happen, and whether the treasury and westminster are going to get away with yet another betrayal of um the 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 regions outside of the m25 um yeah and to be honest I, I, there's no news there's no uh there's no uh covid statistics because uh it's a pre-record so i think given that there's going to be quite a lot to chew through uh without further ado we're going to crack on with tonight's episode so uh welcome to tonight's rail natter everyone <laughs> the Intercity 225 fades away. Oh, there it goes. And I'm gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna slide on to the next image here, which is, um, which is probably not a bad place to start. But before I talk about what on earth is on screen, let's go back to Jen, Jennifer. That was chaotic. That was a chaotic start for a for a, a chaotic episode. You're a first. You're our first guest of the post 100 episodes era, which is a strange claim. We've done a hundred of these um already last week's was the like the 101st episode even though this is episode 101 uh, never mind <laughs> but um yeah well, well so i'm um, honored to have you as our first uh, first guest for the next hundred the next sort of between one and 200 episodes which uh let's see how it, if, it, if it survives that long but um yeah jen uh, firstly um Maybe you want to introduce yourself because there might be people who've not come across you um, on Twitter or not not seen you being uh, hounded by uh, the latest uh, Tory MP who thinks you're misrepresented. I don't know, whatever it happens to be. You haven't managed to come across you on Twitter. Um, tell, tell us about yourself. Uh, yeah, I am the politics investigations editor at the Manchester Evening News, which uh, sort of ends up meaning that I cover uh, anything and everything in reality in terms of... Uh, I suppose public policy really yeah. and trains is just something that keeps you know coming back round and back round and back round and we run campaigns on it we did a campaign after the timetable meltdown in 2018 we did um i mean it came into the power up the north campaign that we ran in 2019 um obviously it's something that andy burnham has made a lot of political hay with so it comes up a lot because of that uh and then integrated rail plan um and, he, and here we are what yeah. can i say yeah. Yeah, <laughs> what absolutely. can i say and then and then you know the the leveling up agenda in general um yeah. i suppose if you're going to take it seriously as an agenda which is questionable in itself but if you're going to take it seriously then it's about um regional imbalance and regional inequality and that's just something that you know you can you can come at that from almost any angle and and i think we have done that from pretty much every angle in the last few years yeah. and transport has been has been one of them and the IRP kind of um, encapsulates it in many respects it I does think. it does mm. and, and the arguments being made in fact that are being made possibly uh, a few days ago in our the, the timeline that this episode will be going out on uh, a few days ago um that the and, it, and it, indeed Andy Burnham was pushing this within the transport select committee uh, evidence the oral evidence session he was saying 
there hasn't been a leveling up assessment, and it feels like that's going to be the that's going to be the mallet that's going to be striking the um, that the North are going to be using to strike the the sort of uh, government on on that. So so yes, yeah. um, that that uh, with this episode going out in wait a minute six no nine days <laughs> that should that will yeah. happen people will know about it um <laughs> uh yeah it's been it's currently that's it's embargoed for anyone for people who might manage to time travel into my hard drive uh as of like nine days ago it's embargoed so we've all broken some rules no it's fine um it's yeah fine. so um yeah so that, i mean yeah because uh, we are on uh what day are we on we're on the seventh so tomorrow is the convention of the north in yes. Liverpool. Yeah, yeah, so yeah. Um, the thing that they have told us that we're not allowed to talk about, but we can talk about because this is being transmitted <laughs> yeah, yeah, way, yeah. is that um, tomorrow the mayors, are, the Labour mayors in the North are going to be shouting a lot at Michael Gove basically about the IRP and, as you say, that levelling up assessment and the fact that um, on the background papers it doesn't look like any kind of proper economic analysis was actually... Yeah done before the IRP was kind of set in stone uh, and they are clearly planning to do that tomorrow because it's it's an ambush on Michael Gove really because he's also yeah. going to be at the same conference. And he's and, and, and as, as one of the potential prime ministerial candidates he's not a bad person to be mobbing with this because it, it'll make clear what the what um what 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 his um, targets are going to be or what his challenge is going to be if he happens to take the um to, to find himself in number 10. Um, yeah, it, transport is. Uh, pe people often dismiss rail. It's like, oh, it's it's it's, it's an ethereal thing that a lot of kind of middle class people get excited about, but actually it doesn't mean much to to normal travelling people. Well, I challenge them to take the train in Manchester on mm. a, uh, Russia at any time, <clears throat> and suggest to me that it's a load of sort of uh, top hatted uh, business people moving around. It's the railways, buses are absolutely heaving in Manchester and are all completely oversubscribed and and hopeless. And so people need the trains as well. And the trains are, I was traveling by train actually during the, during the time, and in the, up to, in fact, specifically at the time of the meltdown, I was traveling by train. I had a meeting in uh, halfway to Warrington. So I had to take, so I had to work through Oxford Road and all the way. And it was absolutely awful. And the idea of, of, of relying on that from my day, like for, for my career, like my day job, for my money-making job every single day was hopeless, you know, trains absolutely in, in not necessarily paces you know brand new trains but absolutely yeah. rammed and crowded and just it was hopeless so it means a lot to people and that's why it and all, the other thing is it's worth very briefly saying is that growth on the railways mm. in you know in terms of numbers post covid but also generally over the last 30 years have been immense those those numbers yeah. are immense and particularly in and around the north in and around manchester and leeds um so it so it is important so um conscious of time i'm going to hop back to uh, let's get our two small faces up here i'm going to hop back to um obviously it's resizing every time i go between them well, well i'll just have to resize every time it's fine um so uh, in my submission to the integrated rail uh, plan inquiry for the transport select committee i pointed out uh, i kind of made a point about leveling up and i was trying to say well what does what does leveling up actually mean in terms of railways well uh, kind of generally the idea that within the m25 you turn up to a railway station and you don't care when the next train is because it's going to be within the next five minutes or ten minutes right at, at most you've got 10 minutes to wait and you hop on the train and you go wherever you want to go outside of the m25 it's very rare that that's the case you turn up to take a train that you um uh, that you've had scheduled there's a chance that there's two hours between your tra between the t before the next train arrives um and also those trains are often very small and rattly and slow and so that means like whereas and so in my in my IRP evidence I use this uh, this example of like looking at Shenfield which is at the end of the kind of crossrail line out towards Anglia where they have you know upwards of 10 to 15,000 seats per hour towards London towards the nearest major capital and you go to somewhere like um actually Marsden is a good example uh, we were talking about Marsden a second ago because it's where the, the, the you know it's been made famous by the IRP and um, it has you know 400 seats an hour to Manchester um, at peak time, the rest of the day, it's it's half that. You know, it's it's hopeless, absolutely hopeless. That's the difference. It's it's orders of magnitude of like not just thousands, but tens of thousands of seats is what the potential could be. That's what leveling up is. It's 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 as simple as that. If you don't have those if you don't have those seats, you don't have those opportunities. It's like oh, but no one. And this was made in the transport the, the session. It was like oh, but no one, no one. Only a few hundred people travel between Manchester and Bradford just now. It's like you don't measure the need to build a bridge by how many people swim across a river. You know, it's, yeah, it's quite, yeah. yeah. Anyway, so enough of me waffling about this. The reason I talk about the transport select committee is because 
Um, one of the things that kept being intimated towards Andy Burnham in the first oral evidence session was basically this theme. It was, be happy with what you've been given. And this, well, I, I thought we'd explore this for, for maybe 10 minutes and, and just have an idea of how, what, how and why, and maybe we'll talk even more about it when we get to the history bit, but how and why this is a real, just, just really insulting and totally lacks any understanding of what, what transport, but also general policy and investment has been like in the North. So it's worth kind of exploring that and why it's been such, you know, the idea, why it just made everyone sort of wince when they were told, oh, why are you not happy about billions being spent? You know, be grateful for it. Yeah, I think, um, I mean, I watched that select committee as it was happening as well. And I, the impression that I got was that, uh, and I could be wrong about this, it wasn't the whole committee that was saying, ha taking that kind of attitude towards Andy Burnham. It was sort of two or three Tory MPs. Mm. And it seemed to me that it felt quite coordinated. And I almost wondered whether it was, um, it was kind of just it, like it was designed to wind up Andy Burnham, really, in many respects. That's what it felt like to me. It felt like trolling. Yeah. Um, the problem with that, obviously, is that you're also trolling a lot of people in the north of England, aside from the mayor that you really don't like. And 156 um, MPs as well. <laughs> yeah, and, and I think the problem is that that kind of attitude, that be happy with, be grateful for what you're given, mm. um, kind of taps in perfectly. It, it's precisely the problem with, yeah. with all of this stuff. And people feel that that's kind of the way that policy has been made for really quite a long time, not just on, on rail. I think kind of politically as well, it's an odd tack to take, really, because it plays straight into Andy Burnham's hands. Um, you know, this guy that presumably intensely annoys you, <laughs> but you're actually just doing him a favour. If Labour is, uh, and I think the thing, and we'll probably we'll come back to this at the end, but I think um, the other thing is it helps Labour to kind of build a narrative mm -hmm. that this is about more than trains. Yeah. This is about... This is about the way that they perceive you and the way that they think about you and the way that they, that, you know, you can have these crumbs off the table. And I think the final point to say is that kind of intellectually and economically, it doesn't stack up. Yeah, enough. It doesn't make any sense. <laughs> it just doesn't yeah. make any sense. <laughs> it's, I keep making this point, like you don't have to be like an mmt -er to understand that, that, that even within a neoliberal framing, like even within a fairly standardised treasury, their own current rubbish treasury rules, <laughs> these investments made good sense that like they, yeah. they were they had a positive bcr whatever that actually means in practice nothing yeah. but like it's entirely political there's there's no financial positive there's, there's no financial sense in reducing and pairing this stuff back the other thing i i make i, I, I it we're both going to get so angry by the end of this aren't we we're going to get yeah, excitable towards I'm trying the to end keep myself calm i know right i, I should have i should have brought some ice an ice pack up with me um <laughs> It's like you don't write a check for a hundred billion or whatever it is, and then it disappears off. You, the money is just getting spent as quickly as it can be burned annually, and we're limited in that sense, not by cash, but by the number of engineers, you know, the number of me's there are, and, and to yeah, actually yeah, build yeah. the thing and design the thing. So the treasury wouldn't be spending any more money a year if it was a hundred billion. Or it's, it's, so it's just it's entirely political, and and I hope. I hope that that gets picked up and, and, and really and, and following that can get quite ethereal, but I, I hope with following the this leveling up sort of attacking leveling up or the lack of a leveling up assessment potentially might cut through. I don't know. I, I, it's hard to tell. We'll maybe get to that shortly about, about whether you think it will cut through. But uh, yeah, mm. it is incredibly frustrating. So on the back of um, being grateful for what we're given, going to miniaturize mm. our faces again, being grateful for what we've given, been given. Um, Let's talk a little bit, very briefly, I promised very briefly, because there's episodes and episodes in this, A History of Broken Promises, and I'm going to keep it, um, I'm going to keep it up in the cell neck region for a, for a kind of weird uh, unitary authority fans out there. I'm going to keep it in the cell neck region because it's an area that you're very familiar with, it's your patch as it were, so I thought I'd keep it, keep it Greater Manchester. Wait a minute, I'm trying to remember what cell neck stands for now, South Eastern Lancashire and North East Eastern Cheshire. Cheshire, isn't it? Yeah. yeah. It's quite catchy, actually, even if it is a bit of a yeah. weird name. Uh, it's a good logo. It's a good logo, isn't it? It's some serious mm. retro vibes going on. Anyway, yeah. we're going to jump forwards to 19... Or jump backwards, rather, to 1972. Because in 1972, um, uh, Manchester's railway network kind of looked like this. Uh, in fact, I'm going to get my pen out so I can scribble on it. Because... Um, and this, I love this this diagram because it really neatly shows how much there was very much like a northern railway network and a southern railway network within Manchester. You know, with this this, this kind of line this void between the two um and you know it 
if, if you imagine kind of modern, you know, Thameslink is a good example, and Thameslink is the analogy to always use with this. You've got two separate networks separated by, in this instance, it's not the Thames, it's just by two railway companies that didn't like each other. Um, so if you connect these two up with kind of an intensive sort of uh, kind of railway connection here, kind of connecting the two, you actually unlock a lot of potential for people in the top end of the country to get across to the uh, top end of kind of Manchester, Greater Manchester and beyond to connect up to the areas uh, south of the city centre. This, this, this makes good sense. And actually it releases capacity because you've got these terminal stations generally are hopeless for capacity. For, you've got to turn around trains and so on. Actually, if you can, ha- you can also half the number, of, you can reduce the number of trains because you can run them through this sort of high capacity hub and, and you end up with kind of quite a nice uh, service pattern, a bit like Thameslink has, right? So, how do you do that, though? Well, in 1972, the proposal was uh, Pick Vic, the Pick Vic Tunnel, the Manchester Piccadilly to Manchester Victoria Tunnel. And it, uh, with that tunnel came some nice sort of um, uh, city centre stations. So there's one, I don't, I, I, there's one here on the, the kind of near St. Peter's Square. There's one here on Coronation Street. Uh, that's right, Coron- uh, no, Corporation Street, not Coronation Street. I'm getting, I'm good. Don't, don't shoot me. I'm, I'm from the other side of the Pennines. I'm, I'm making fine. everyone in Manchester feel out there in Coronation Street. Uh, and there was another one on Whitworth Street uh, down here, um, kind of near Oxford Road Station. And you kind of ended up with, uh, there's another one, and there's Victoria with its underground, and then Piccadilly would have had an underground sort of station as well. So you have these five new stations would have been built, and you'd have had this kind of high-capacity core. A very common project that happens in mainland Europe, I, I shall point out. This is a really common thing that happens. Um, uh, because it unlocks a lot of capacity, it separates um, long distance and regional services from the kind of the commuter and suburban services, which means that the, you end up with a better running railway. And there's obviously this sort of there's some vibes going on here with this branding as well. It's kind of quite nice, modern, future looking. Actually, the thing that it's like a pinball machine. I don't even seen pictures of it. It's like a pinball machine that you could push a button and push where you want it to go. And it had like Selnek Futuro route and it oh, lit things wow. up. It's in like the it's in, I think it's in what like the transport museum in Manchester. It looks very. Oh, let's awesome. go and have a look at that. That sounds ace. Yeah, yeah, it's pretty cool. Anyway, so that was that was the proposal. But what happened to said proposal? So let's let's go to 1971, which is actually when the first time I said 72 in the early side, but actually 71 was when it was first kind of proposed. So we start in 1971 with our with our lovely um lovely Pick Vic proposals. Uh, sadly, come 1977, uh, they had been cancelled. Uh, Treasury said no. Um, in this case, I believe it was a wait. 77 would have been a Labour government, um, and it was the strangely as well because departments change around. I think it was the, the the Department of Trade and Industry or something that just said no. So that was, and also there were some changes in. This also sounds familiar. Probably there were some changes in the way that devolved powers work. So the the Communities Act, I think had empowered greater manchester in a way that was then stripped back again by the by the mid to late 70s so they lost some power with being able to approach treasury directly which Mm. um, meant that pickvick was cancelled sadly but don't worry because another plan came up a plan called the castlefield cord uh, which appeared in 1979 which was going to kind of do a bit like what the what pickvick was going to do but just without the stations uh, in the middle of the city sadly it was cancelled immediately uh so uh no luck there so what's coming next well we have to jump forwards to 1984 for the next proposal and do catch me jen if if, if something yeah, in I... here that if, if there's something in here that you've got inside so so 1984 we've changed color to yellow and why might we have done that well proposals start getting developed um for manchester metrolink and by 1991 construction actually starts on manchester metrolink it only it t- takes them kind of actually I've been cheeky because there were ideas about kind of light rail sort of circulating earlier than that. But really, 1984 was the first time they, they kind of really it kind of shaped. And actually, it came down to like des- almost desperation in the in the kind of the late 80s at this point. Um, Greater Manchester Council essentially thieved a, a, a DLR, a Docklands light rail train, and run, ran it on a branch line in Manchester to show that it would work. <laughs> and to just trying to convince Treasury that this is, yes, no, we, it's a train and it runs on this tracks, it's thing, real. It's, fine. it's a thing, yeah, <laughs> fund it, please. Um, and in fairness, uh, actually, I say in fairness, uh, probably because of a substantial volume of uh, European Union regional development funding um, came through, e, uh, ERDF funding came through to help su- sort of match fund uh, Metrolink, which started being constructed in 1991. Um, uh, that's when I was born. Anyway, so 1992, a new, another thing appears. So while Metrolink is happening, another thing appears, and this thing is Trans Pennine Electrification. 
The yeah. idea of electrifying the railway across the Pennines uh, is raised... I mean, it had been mentioned informally through the 80s, but 1992, a proper plan was being studied, uh, kind of developed. There was a study group. There were kind of... Things were in the works. 1995, the... Um, what was known weirdly as the train operating unit, so it was like not quite fully franchised, but also not British Rail anymore. Um, they also submitted another plan, so the plans became more advanced in 1995. Indeed, uh, things kind of kept moving, at least from a development perspective, um, and ever slower and slower and slower. By 2001, this thing still existed, and it was being called the Trans Pennine Route Development Project. Uh, interesting. Um, some some hauntology going on here. Uh, sadly, in 2003, it was cancelled. Um, <laughs> you're smiling. It's a theme. You didn't know. It's so mean to laugh all of it. It's, it's just, just really funny. It's just so frustrating, isn't it? Uh, in 2003, it was cancelled by the Strategic Rail Authority because, oh no, you don't need to electrify. We're going to procure a bunch of nice diesel trains to replace the other diesel trains that were being run. Um, so along came the, the Class 185s, and that meant that they didn't need to electrify anything, obviously. Problem solved, right? Well, okay, let's jump to 2010. A huge gap of absolutely nothing useful happening. Um, and it's, we've gone back up to the Castlefield Curve because it gets re, it gets renamed to the Ordsall Cord. And, um, and indeed, uh, it, uh, it, the, the proposals are sensible. They become part of this Northern Hub proposal, which would include two new platforms at Manchester Piccadilly. Somebody, point, somebody pointed out to me, actually, not that long ago, that there was a little bit of chat under the last Labour government, at the very back end of the last Labour government, mm about the Castlefield Corridor. I don't know whether it was necessarily all to accord, but Andrew Adonis visited Piccadilly in about 2009 and said, yes, this is, uh, this is, yes, we definitely need to do something about this. So, yes, because Northern Hub was being, init was initiated in 2009. Mm -hmm. So yeah, Network yeah. Rail started looking at those plans. So really, I should, this my dot here, I'll take note for the next episode. It should take really it back be a year. It's just quite satisfying because it's like, ah, yes, this actually spans another government. Yeah, no, yeah, it's yeah, another <laughs> government. I know, right? So, yeah, you're right. 2009 there. Um, and, um, and we're going back to electrification again because in 2011, sort of advanced, sort of separate to the Northern Hub proposals, but it swallowed into what then became known as the, the Great Northern Rail Project, which there are still stickers of the GNRP on the side of trains here and there, which makes me laugh and cry simultaneously. 2011, <laughs> electrification returns. 2014, something even more exciting happens, which is that, that, that George Osborne and a bunch of Northern councillors um, and council leaders say, oh, you know what would be good? A new trans Pennine high-speed line connecting oh, yeah. Liverpool, Manchester, um, Bradford, brackets, um, and then Leeds, definitely, and then on to Hull and up towards Newcastle. That'd be a good idea. Hmm. Sadly, we reached 2015, and uh, trans Pennine electrification's been cancelled again. Uh, jump force to 2016, and the Orchestral Cord is actually finished. Uh, they, they, they build it. Um, uh, actually, this is kind of... Actually, I should have had a, dot, a dotted line there. Sorry, that should be... Um, they didn't build it. This is them planning it. Planning that should be dot, dashed. As you can see, very professional. Then they build it um, in 20... They open it in 2017. Sadly, um, the platform 15 and 16 bit, i.e. the really important bit to make the Ordsal cord work, uh, gets cancelled. Yeah, they just uh, so didn't do the rest of it. They just didn't do the rest of it. So yeah. what they did was build a very expensive and admittedly very snazzy looking uh, network arch railway bridge, looking very snazzy, mm. to carry way. two trains an hour. Uh, and indeed, the problem with just building that bit is actually, if you remember our map from earlier, actually, I won't skip back to it, but our map from earlier showing the two halves of the railway network, the orbital cord serves to just connect those in a way that reflects delays across the whole network rather than just keeping it separate and just north and south. So really not a good idea. Um, ugh, anyway, but the shiny, import, the shiny snazzy bit got built. That's the important yeah. thing, right? Um, mm. Oh, look, 2018 and the transparent electrification's returned again magically. Um, and uh, then we jump forward to 2019, and we have the Prime Minister making firm promises that Northern Powerhouse Rail will be delivered. Fantastic. That's very exciting. Mm. Um, and actually, meanwhile, 1991 to 2020 sees uh, three or four phases plus extra bits added to Metrolink. So mm. Manchester Metrolink gets extra bits added to it. And in 2020, the last section opens, which was the, um, the line to Trafford Park, I think, was the last bit um, in 2020. So lots of investment. Um, essentially a bit of a rolling program of, of 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 kind of tram extensions which is good you know it's, it's good stuff it's it's heavily mm -hmm. used arguably not good enough though in terms of it's already full and it's too slow for people who are at the fringes trying to get across to the other side of manchester so it, it's not really a replacement for pickvic it's a thing that should have happened as well on top of it so 
Ah, yes, we reached 2021. And what happens in 2021? The IRP cancels uh, Northern Powerhouse Rail and, well, and it merges it into uh, Transpennine Electrification. In fairness, you know, Transpennine Electrification continues to be a thing. That hasn't been cancelled yet. Um, so there we have it. We're at the point where you can see quite a few of these um, and then another one and then another one and then more cancel. And, and there's a bit of a theme emerging here, I think. Um yeah, a bit of a theme. And what is that theme? Well, the theme is treasury. The theme <laughs> is treasury. Treasury hate spending money, and they really hate spending money outside the M25. And I, and actually, they hate spending... And, and I'm, I'm talking about this... Uh, what am I talking I'm talking about this in a... Oh, on, a, on an appearance on a thing that has happened, but I don't know if it's been published yet. But it's exciting, and I've appeared on it before. Um, everyone who's listening, very elusive, I know, but I don't know if it's actually happened yet. So... Um, which is actually the Treasury hate investing within London as well. Um, so they just hate investing full stop. But invariably, that comes down hardest in places that haven't seen lots of investment already. So the areas that have just never had major investment um, since the 1800s, basically, uh, suffer the worst from that. So that's my that's my potted level. That's my potted history. That was excellent. I, I, I don't think enjoy is quite the right word. Yeah. But... <laughs> yeah. oh, it's painful, isn't it? <laughs> but I was, um, it was really, there was something quite satisfying about seeing it all laid out like that. Yeah, yeah. I think I'll, I'll tidy this up and then um, and then maybe I'll, I'll do a bit of a Twitter thread on it and then make it retweeted. Oh, yeah, I love it's... it. Because, uh, yeah, this, this this is quite fun. And I think it's going to get more detailed. But I will do a version that's even messier, show it because it'll have even more big red crosses on it, um, showing yeah. things like Leeds Super Tram and uh, oh, other yeah. sort of projects as well. So let's talk about levelling up. Oh, unless you have any other history additions, but um, I, I think... I, no, I, I don't. I mean, I've been there. I've lived from some of that graphic. Um, yeah. And... Uh, yeah, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I think I think you summed it up. It's 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 certainly there are certainly themes. If it was going to yeah. be a franchise, you'd say there is certainly a theme, and that theme is things being denied and cancelled. Yes. So, talking of which, <laughs> talking of money never being spent, indeed. Let's talk about leveling up. So, when we talk about leveling up, we've talked about leveling up's been a bit of an ethereal, made-up concept for a long time, but it's it's become real by merit of the fact that Michael Gove put it into a PDF. Um, also, it's his, it's his job. It's his job. Oh, yeah, he's minister of, of the levelling up, um, yeah. which is very exciting for him, I'm sure. Mm. Um, you've had the unfortunate pleasure of, well, I don't know, you've, basically you've picked through this, this fairly detailed, complicated document, and I'm not telling you to recall it uh, page by page, but <laughs> what are the broad themes, firstly, in the, in the document? Um, you know, what are your feelings of it? And then maybe we'll have a bit more of a detailed chat in relation to sort of uh, kind of what it means for the North specifically. Um, well, the, I guess the first thing to say is that there's, the first section of it is this sort of uh, intellectual blue sky history lesson oh, yeah. bit where yeah. they talk about the Medicis and they talk about oh, um, Jericho and a bit and some Roman Empire. It goes Empire a bit Reese smog at the start, does it? Well, I just, I, I, I would be lying if I said that I had read most of that bit. Um, because that, <laughs> I had so many people saying to me what a nightmare it was that I just thought I ha haven't got time. I'll take everybody's word for it. That there is this kind of huge bit of padding out at the beginning. It's, that, um, it's so you know. much this government, isn't it? That it's like oh, a <laughs> three hundred page document that's supposed to be about the people in the north. We're going to yes. spend a hundred pages of it, or not in the north, sorry, about the regions. It is about all of the regions in, in the UK. And the it is, of yeah, it is, yeah, um, yeah. And, and we're going to spend a hundred pages of said three hundred page report. Uh, just doing it, probably a fairly hackneyed job of representing classical history. That's just yeah, so I, much I, well, what I'd expect. Apparently, that some of it was pasted in from Wikipedia, oh, and um, it's just the worst. It was uh, um, it's most so of the embarrassing. Ways, <laughs> most of the ways that kind of people that did read it characterised it involved swear words that I can't repeat on a family <laughs> rail podcast. Um, but take take it as read that, that there was that bit, and then there's a second bit which talks about which is essentially their analysis. And it's talking about, um, it's got some, you know, pretty sensible analysis in there. It talks about um, how and why decades of attempts to sort of boost regional, boost regional growth haven't worked. Mm. Um, one of the reasons being that it's really, really stop start. Each government comes up with a different idea, yeah. sometimes contradicts itself within its own government. Uh, and then the next government comes along and gets rid of it and, you know, knocks down the thing that was set up to do regional growth and moves it a bit and adds some extra bells and whistles to it. And then the next government comes along and so on and so on. And, you know, not 
less and less in the way of local autonomy. Um, lots of bidding into kind of a multitude of central government uh, pots of funding that um, then aren't really assessed for evidence, yeah. aren't really monitored. Uh, you the know, Spider Man means... looking at Spider Man meme is currently yes. like, <laughs> it's exactly. like, yeah, exactly. yeah, yeah, this is all true stuff that we all shout very loudly about. Yeah, quite. And, and I mean, on the day that the Leveling Up White Paper came out, there was a National Audit Office report that came out about Gove's own department that said, <laughs> since 2010, you've been spending money on local growth, but you haven't bothered to find out whether it's worked. Mm. And you have absolutely no data to show whether or not it's worked. I think they've been using some kind of data from Europe, which is fine, but it's not the places that they were investing money in. Yeah. And so they just don't know what works. So now... They're coming up with another load of policies, but they haven't got any evidence from the last decade to really inform what they're doing anyway. So there was all that, and that came out on the same day. But that section, I mean, most of the people that I spoke to afterwards have said, yeah, you know, that the, it's good to see that analysis. Um, you know, there's nothing particularly wrong with that analysis. Uh, it's stuff that we've been saying for a very long time. Um, th there was an overlap, I think, with the original industrial strategy that um, was one of the many ah. strategies that sort of appeared and died. I think yeah. there's been there's, there's I think some of what's used in that section has essentially come from from that. Um, lots of analysis about things like health inequalities and regional transport spending and, and all of that. And then you get onto the policy bit, which is basically the why. You know, they've said what we need to do is rebalance economically and health wise and in all the other, these other ways. And we need to make it less stupid and we need places to have more devolution, blah, blah, blah. And then you get to the list of Whitehall policies and it just doesn't match it yeah. at all. It just doesn't match it. Um, there's, a, there's, there's some positive stuff in there on things like R&D, but, um, but broadly it is things that we already knew about or in some cases directly contradict the aims of the white paper, like the IRP. Yeah. I mean, the IRP is in there. As their oh, main... They've quoted it as a, they've actually put it in the paper. Yeah, I think it's like basically its main rail thing. Oh my God. Yeah. Um... I mean, so, so does it, <laughs> a bit like the, a bit like some of the documents that I've been reading recently, uh, in, not just the IRP, but some of the other documents, does it read like sections of, does it read a bit like there was a bigger section and it's just been stripped back or, or that it was written with the hope that it would be more and Treasury's just basically kiboshed it all. What, no. What's the kind of vibe when you read through it? The vibe is more that each department has just put in whatever it was they were doing anyway. Really? Yeah. Yeah. And in the DFT ca DFT's case, that's the IRP. Yeah. So there's a kind of box on the IRP saying the IRP is really good. Um, uh, Great British Railways gets mentioned a few mm. times. Um uh what's the other thing the beaching lines that they're looking oh. at replacing gets mentioned a few times yeah. Yeah. um and then there's a bit of stuff around uh you know we want to have a conversation about giving places maybe a bit more control over local networks so you know greater manchester for example has been arguing for a while that they want to have devolved control over stations yeah. so like there's a bit of a mix of that in there where it's the kind of local network but on like big rail stuff i had a check before i came on this and i couldn't really it was just a list of things that they're doing anyway that i i, I don't know whether i'm missing something but i couldn't see anything more than that that's that. So the the other kind of the rail the other rail people or the other policy people who looked at it say exactly the same as you have. It's just it's right. Just, okay, it's good. Just, well, that's very true. Yeah, it's just all the stuff <laughs> yeah. that's been. There's there's nothing new in it. No, um, and it's it's such a common thing that you get the researchers probably the you know the researchers in whichever well in this department what it used to be communities right it used to be ML MLG yeah. or MCL whatever it was now leveling up stupidly named department. Um, Probably, you know, as you say, the the chunk of it that's not the the weird classics uh, copy paste yeah. homework, or the or the what this government is actually doing. The middle bit of analysis of of, of, of problems is is bob on. Yeah, and it, it's the same with the the Great British. It's the same with quite a lot of things like bus back better, which obviously Treasury is now chopped in half. At, at, yeah. you know, lots of good analysis in that. The, the the railway strategy documents that have come out, a couple of them other than the IRP, actually have quite a lot of good analysis in them. But then when it comes to what's actually being done about it, it just falls over. Um, yeah. Uh, yeah, and it's just so frustrating. Uh, yeah, so what in terms of non-rail things, what else is there in there that, that, that might, that, that you know, what other things are there that you picked out? Um, well, I mean, I think 
uh, uh, given that we've just lived through a global pandemic, you'd sort of that played out extremely unequally in this country. Mm. I mean, just kind of painfully unequally. Um, uh, you know, many of the places that were hardest hit in the country are on my patch in Greater Manchester. Mm. Um, and a lot of that is for all of the things that we know about a deprivation, about um, the quality of, uh, of housing, about the relationship between, uh, you know, uh, uh, low wage jobs and, uh, you know, all the things that drive the likelihood that you're going to have a lower life expectancy and be at greater risk from, in this case, a communicable disease, a communicable virus, yeah, but yeah. You know, it could be any number of other things. We know this, right? We have literally just lived through it. And yet under the section on health inequalities, which has its own goal, like it has a goal uh, that we're going to now the divide on healthy life expectancy by 2030. And I think it puts a number on it by 2035. Mm. Um, this is our goal. And then when you read the bit about how they're going to do it, there's a bit about we're going to build some hospitals. It's like, yes, but I thought the point was that you wanted to keep people out of the hospital. Yeah, <laughs> yes, quite. That's not really the first thing I would put on that no. list. And then it says um, the Department of Health is going to do uh, a white paper about this. <laughs> and that's, that's it. Brilliant. So it's like, OK, so the strategy for this is just not a strategy because it doesn't exist yet. Yeah. Um, and then, you know, a bit like trains. You've also got the government doing things alongside that that run directly counter to it, like, um, you know, cutting public health grants in real terms yeah. or, uh, you know, some of the stuff around social care or yeah, council um, budgets of, being st stripped out. So housing exactly. and social care can't be. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Exactly. Exactly. So um, it's it's that feeling of the again of the government facing in two directions at once. There's obviously some people in there, people like Andy Haldane and um, Neil O'Brien, who were one of the ministers in that department now, who's been a he's kind of been quite big on regional equality for quite a long time, and he was involved in the Greater Manchester Devolution Deal back when he worked for George Osborne. Mm. Um, you know, there's some there's some fairly kind of like deep thinkers on these subjects in there, but then the problem is that your list of policies just doesn't match up to it at all. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And this is where, you know, this is, for me, it's like, it sounds like this is this is a deep problem with the document, but I, to what extent Treasury is just essentially saying no to anything, or is yeah. there just an, in, or, or is there just basically a complete lack of vision and imagination within government at the moment? Is, you know, within the, the, the rank of ministers in government at the moment, is there just a lack of imagination and, 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 and experience, but, but particularly imagination and vision, you know, I, I it's just a lack a lot of it is a lack of imagination of what things could be and what what things could look like that, that feels like that for me okay putting ideology to one side it feels just like a lack of vision a lack of a lack of thought of what potential could be i think there's there's probably several things happening like yeah i mean the, the hand of the treasury is is in there i mean the, the comprehensive spending review set the three-year budget in November and go kind of had to work backwards from that, really. Yeah. So, I mean, there was no extra money provided for this agenda. So what he then had to do because of that was go around the Whitehall departments and essentially try and sort of negotiate things out of them, which is, I think, why for some departments you just see things that have nothing to do with levelling up that they were already doing, which are just kind of listed as levelling up policies. So you've got that problem. I think you've got a problem which is that anything of this nature requires, uh, you know, it's hard. I mean, one of the one of the reasons that George Osborne got a bit of devolution through was because he was the chancellor, number one, and that so you've got the power of the treasury behind you. But number two, he just he just went through Whitehall insisting that things happened and in some cases just overruled ministers and just did it. Um, you have to be uh, really hell bent on pursuing an agenda like that. And you have got you've got to have the whole of Whitehall behind you. And it's like really, really hard work. And you're trying to do that at a point when the government could not be in more chaos. Yeah. It's hollowed out in terms of, I don't know, like institutional knowledge, leadership. Yeah. Yeah. Um it's uh it's exhausted in parts. It's uh it's it, I mean, politically... trust, trust between major, like trust between senior yeah. civil servants is at an all time low. Trust between senior civil servants is at an all time low. I mean, even if you just think over the last few days, what are the consequences of the fact that number 10 is in such a mess? Yeah. Well, number 10 can't then exert its authority across across Whitehall. And fundamentally, this is supposed to be a number 10 agenda. This is supposed to be Boris Johnson's yeah. agenda. But um, 
you know, you, you're now in a position where if number 10 sort of goes and tells departments to do something, then they're more likely to kind of go, yeah, well, make me. And that's, yeah. that's possibly what's happened with the with the health backlog stuff that's been happening today, which would be a bit out of date by the time this goes goes out, where there had been a plan for a big announcement and big number 10 announcement about clearing the health backlog. And it appears that Treasury said no. Well, did Treasury say no because because they can? now yeah, yeah, because they don't yeah. really want to help the pm because it looks like he's in his dying days yeah etc etc et cetera, et cetera. the worst thing you want is is a is is the the head of the kind of the leader of the country uh the pm not having treasury you know and and treasury and and the chance of the exchequer going in different directions we have been there before it is not healthy but this feels like uh, as much of a crisis of the two of them pulling apart as, as because it means that nothing gets done Treasury yeah, don't right. want to do anything by default, so they have to be told to. And if they don't want, if they're decided, oh, we're not going to listen to anyone, that means nothing's getting done. Yeah, <laughs> so, yeah just... exactly. So you end up with a kind of form of paralysis. And we've been in a form of paralysis on this, as your lovely graphic of cancelled rail yeah. schemes in Manchester shows, <laughs> for a very, very long time already. And it's like, I don't know whether you can become more paralysed, but, but yeah, I think and, even, and, and even if this more. Was... If this was a, if this was a, if I was, if I was better at the broad subject, I'd have, you know, I could have put things to do with social care or, 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 or kind of oh, yeah. housing against, against that little graph of things that are cancelled or, or, or reductions. You know, I could put a, behind it, I could put a graph of reduced, or I could put a graph of, you know, funding per bus route or whatever. You know, all these things yeah, tie in absolutely. together, and uh, fundamentally, you need to invest in communities to make them thrive. You know, it's, it's not, it's not rocket science. Yeah, no, and, 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 and that investment doesn't disappear down the toilet. That's the the other thing is there's an idea that investment is just is just a subsidy. You chuck the money, and never can see it back. The whole point is, if people have opportunities, they bring more revenue to the exchequer. It's the it's that's that's neoliberal. That's not me being a socialist. That's that's neoliberal politics. That's 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 the, that's we're theoretically accepted that that's how it works. But um, yeah, anyway, it's, yeah. it's frustrating, isn't it? And I think I think the other point about them, uh, where the IRP comes into it, where they, um, you know, they're s s sort of pulling in two different directions at the same time, is that if this white paper is saying we are going to be, uh, we need to be evidence based, and we need yeah. to accept that the policies that we've done in the past either haven't worked or we don't even know because we haven't bothered to find out, then this time round we need to be basing stuff on on what works. And where the IRP is concerned, and this is the point that the Northern leaders are making, mm. the, the technical stuff that was that was published eventually that had to be dragged out of them a couple yeah. of months later, showed that they hadn't done any proper economic analysis. So they haven't done you know, any proper railway analysis either. There, it's an evident, <laughs> the whole document. Honestly, it's totally evidence free, evidence free yeah. on policy, and 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 as you say, that's the whole thing that leveling up Seneca says. Exactly. <laughs> start, yeah. Exactly. There's this, there's this part of the kind of background technical bit where it says, well, um, yeah, we could have analysed what it would have meant for jobs and people and businesses to be moving into, for example, Bradford, mm -hmm. or the impact on land values. Like we could have done all of that to see what difference it would have made, um, but it would have taken ages. Like that's literally their answer. Yeah. So we didn't. And it's like, yeah, that's why the that's why these proposals <laughs> existed as yeah. they did before because that work had been done to a certain yeah. extent. You know, oh, NPR, you know, Northern like Powerhouse Partnership, and and ah, <laughs> uh, yeah, and TFN had done a lot of that work, and that's why yeah. they proposed the routes they had. <laughs> and if you don't like the answer to TFN's analysis, well, at least do your own. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Yeah, just, anyway. just, uh, right, I'm conscious of time, yeah. and I, yes. I'm, I'm trying to make myself a one-hour podcast person rather than the usual, like, one and a half, two hours, particularly as I've taken up a lot of evening. So, fair. let's move on to the next question, the next th kind of theme that I'd like us to sort of pick apart, which is... Um, which is basically, will government get away with it? You know, will they get away with the cancellation of... I, I know we've talked a lot about Greater Manchester, so there's the focus yeah, on yeah. the Powerhouse Rail, but let me just... And this is possibly worth being explicit about. And I'll, in fact, tell you what, I'll get the maps up and I'll explain the point. It's worth being explicit that the cancellation of high speed of the eastern leg of HS2, that impacts on Manchester because it means more people are going to have to go through Manchester which means that the capacity is limited, which means trains that might have to go through there, which means um, to service a lot more long distance trains at the sa sacrificing local capacity. So so the cancellation of HS2 East impacts on Andy Burnham in more than just a, 
oh, well, you know, we as a North want to have HS2 East. It, it will literally impact on rail services in Manchester, the lack of that, yeah. that bit. But anyway, here's, an, here's my nice map, um, which I gifified uh, on the day that the IRP was released, I think, and it did the rounds, which is quite nice. So here's the map. Here's what the plans were. So we have... Um, Oh, I've got my back to my red, dreadful red pen again. But you can sort of, in fact, you know what? I'm going to change pen color because all the uh, people with um, uh, monochromatism don't recognize and find the colors. Where are we? In color. Let's make it. Let's make it bright yellow. I mean, see it nice and clearly. So uh, you've got the eastern leg here. There it is. Lovely. There's the eastern leg doing its thing, going through Toten and up to Leeds, and then connecting up north. Fine. And then you've got the HS2 uh, phase 2A, which goes up to Crewe, and then the rest of it, which is the western leg, 2B western leg, goes up to Manchester um, via kind of a weird kink bit there. And then Northern Power has rail, should have been. Government never committed to the Liverpool bit, but frankly, the Liverpool bit was sort of... TFN proposed the Liverpool bit. Liverpool bit goes into, into Manchester, then up, following the M62 mostly, and actually into Bradford. That was pretty well confirmed, uh, to be honest, in the latter part, into Leeds and then onwards. That, that was NPR. And, and, and then if we want to look at what um, the kind of the before and after, the IRP did this to those plans. <laughs> yeah, there we go. It's a bit less on the map now. Um, and indeed, uh, the impact of that is that you've got this, this whole area here, the East Midlands, this big section here, essentially loses all of the release capacity benefits. So the chance for you to have more frequent services to places like Belper or uh, or some of the, or kind of Mansfield and all these different places that are kind of really underserved. We were talking about it before the, before recording, actually. All these parts of the East Midlands that are pretty abandoned, sort of post, kind of, not maybe post-industrial in a, in a huge chimneys and, and coal faces type way, but actually are quite post-industrial and, and quite deprived. Uh, they get nothing. Um, Nottingham, all the kind of hinterland behind Nottingham that really is quite deprived, nothing. Um, and then all of the benefits into Leeds, obviously. And then this area, actually an area that I care a lot about, which is kind of the, the West Yorkshire and South Yorkshire blob. It's a really weird part of the country because you've got these strange, wide, upgraded roads that were upgraded entirely to move coal around in the, in the light 70s. And then you've got these post-industrial communities that just have nothing. No pub, like the public transport provision is non-existent. There's a bus every three hours, and it's a huge area. And it's also weird because it's kind of a bit more semi-rural. It's it's a very strange part. I did a thread after the the day after the IRP. I got the train from York to Sheffield, the slow road, um, and it just goes through all these communities. And you just go, you know, like through Rotherham and all this. And it's just HS2 not going through here wrecks all those. Anyway, so that's bad. But zooming in, uh, so we get a bit more uh, look at you know, kind of Northern Powerhouse Rail and what it meant. There was going to be a station. So this is actually a bit closer showing what it has. So you have, there was going to be a station at Warrington. There's going to be a station at Bradford. Um, and that has now uh, been chopped. And indeed, I've left the little dashed line because they are going to build just a weird little spur up to Marsden. They are Marsden, made famous now by the, uh, the IRP. Just this weird little spur. But that's it. That's the difference. For what, there's that's... still a little bit running in, isn't there, from the Warrington side as well? Oh, sorry. Of yes, you're line. right. There's a bit. Mm. There's a bit that's going to go. I should have left it on. There's 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 the bit that's going to going to go that bit as well. To that. Yeah. It's going to do that. Yeah. I think that's it. Um. So it's those two. That's it. So that's the difference. Um. Between. It's quite a lot less on the map after that. I think. Yes. So it it does. I mean, going back to our point earlier, it does. When we're told to put up and be grateful for it. This is a little bit insulting. <laughs> a little yes. bit insulting. Yes. Anyway, so um, let's get back to the theme of will the government get away with it? What do you think? What do you think is going to happen? Um, well, if you start, I suppose, with what the government is thinking about it politically, aside from the fact that they just needed to save some money, yeah. um, I think there's there's always been a, a, a thinking within government, particularly among those that were not fans of HS2 anyway, that um, voters are not fabulously bothered about long term infrastructure projects that are not going to appear for the next 20 or 30 years anyway. Yeah. So you can kind of, you know, does it matter too much? Actually, if you give them something that's going to be a quicker win, if you can promise to them that there's going to be like a, a quicker link from your town to that town in a short, you know, that's going to arrive in a short period of time. That's going to be more uh, tangible. That's going to be something that people will go for more. 
they can sell it more easily at the next election. It's not something that you're going to have to wait to the 2040s for. It's not this kind of like abstract concept. So I think there's there's kind of always been that degree of thinking in there, which is why it was no kind of great surprise that they would be scaling back to that extent because I think they just thought, well, how much of an electoral loss is this really yeah. going to be for us? Um, you know, and, and and most people are not going to spend their time kind of getting to grips with the realities of rail capacity and what high-speed rail would mean for their kind of local routes and so on and so on and so on. However, I think the risk is is more about what Labour does with it yeah. and whether or not it can use it as the basis for a narrative that says, here we go again. Yeah. Like here we go again to come back to your point at the beginning of the of the podcast uh, be grateful for what you're given. Yeah. It's that narrative that I think is quite toxic. Yeah. Um and I think Andy Burnham has used that quite successfully already actually in in Greater Manchester as 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 mayor and it may be that there are kind of like other labor figures thinking like how can we use this. Um Yeah, Dan Jarvis has been quite quite loud about it and Braben's actually Speaking, she's been more. She was quite. Oh, she's, she's quite yeah. reserved before the IRP landed, and actually afterwards, she. she so I saw it. The, the TF, the, the Transport for the North conference, and she was kind of being a bit like, "Well, we'll see what's in there. Want to yeah, work yeah. positively with Gove, you know? Yeah, yeah." And she changed her tone quite a lot after the IRP landed. Oh, yeah. So, yeah, 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 absolutely. And I, the only other thing to kind of say, I suppose, is I don't know what you think about this. It could be completely wrong. Um, someone said to me after the Eastern Leg was ditched, they said, "Well." They've already done so much of the CPRing up that route. They've already done so much work on it. Is it possible that they just hold it back and then revive it again in the next election? And I, I, I don't know. I mean, I don't. Yeah. I have no idea. I don't know what you reckon. But. Yeah, I don't know whether it was some weird tactic for them to like come out as if they're heroes by cancelling it for the benefit of. So, so part of the cancellation was. I mean, the the cancellation is very much Gilligan getting his way. Like Andrew yeah. Gilligan, yeah, yeah, yeah. like bits of the IRP are copy pasted from his spectator columns. So, mm. so it's partly that. Partly whether he thinks, ah, oh, well, we'll bin it now. We we're scared after Cheshire and Amersham. We, they, yeah. the, the, the Tories don't want to admit that it's because they, because actually, people in Cheshire and Amersham don't like nasty politics. Even if they are kind of big L and little L liberals, they don't like nasty politics in the way that the Tories have been ex potentially exploiting in, in in other, you know, thinking that that's positive. You know, some of the Brexit narratives don't work, did not work in Cheshire and Amersham. They, they they don't want to tell themselves that. So they're saying, ah, it's about HS2, isn't it? It's about HS2. We don't want to repeat that up the north. So we're going to try and curtail it a bit. And so, you know, they were looking at some of the marginal seats, perhaps, that it went through and and, yeah. and, and thinking. And yeah, it'd be interesting. And, and you're right, actually, I can confirm a huge billions of pounds of design and, and land purchase and preparation work has gone on for, for the Eastern Lake. You know, billions yeah. of pounds worth. And it's I mean, not, there's houses been bought up that now we're just yeah. they still and they're going to hold on to those CPOs as far as I know. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It, it yeah. means it means so all the people who are very upset about HS2 along there, particularly in places like um, uh, Maspera and, and, and some of the places yeah. at Mexborough, sorry, um, Mexborough. Yeah. Um, in, in kind of the Rother Valley. It means decades more. It means at least another decade more uncertainty. It's not. You know, this is not a win for anyone who opposes HS2 along that eastern leg because, frankly, that is the route that the railway will eventually have to take. When they, this yeah. study, this this variously two hundred, hundred, fifty million pound study that even just the IRP can't make up its mind how much that the value of it is. There is yeah. there. Someone quote uh, David Frankel shout out uh, went through the IRP and and he found five different values associated with how much that study about getting HS two into Leeds will be because they the copy editing in that doc. It's a bad document if you ignore the content. Yeah. It's just a very very badly copy edited document because it was pulled together at 2 a.m. Um, I think it had the time they published it in the bottom corner of the report, actually. I did a, an episode did it? a while back. And it had, oh, so the, the, the high-res PDF had the file name, which was like version 23, and it had the time that they PDF'd it, which was like 4 a.m. or something. It was pretty Yeah, good. yeah, 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 yeah. Uh, so that, that document Fantastic. is just a mess. I know, I love that sort of thing. It's proper <laughs> sleuthing stuff. It's good fun. Um, yeah, yeah. So, yeah, just, uh, it's... Yeah, I've I've lost my chair thought because I'm so so frustrated by it. But yeah, no. it's, it's just yeah, it's 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 just a, a flawed document. Um, in terms of whether it comes back at the next election, yeah, it'd be interesting, isn't it? If if that's the tactic, I don't know. If it's they were scared about the potential by elections or maybe the next general election, and maybe they bring it back. I I'm inclined to think Treasury found you know, a mixture of Sunak and Gilligan found a chance to kill a bit of it that they didn't like. Yeah, and they yeah, did yeah, so, yeah. and they reckon yeah. they could bat win the battle with Leeds. And they reckon they probably wouldn't be able to win the battle with Burnham. 
Uh, yeah, and I think that the thing with Leeds, though, I mean, I don't know whether you saw, that I think the day that the IRP landed, I think I'm right in saying that the government had announced it as though, this uh, uh, yeah. was it 100 million for a new tram network and 100 million for... What was the other thing? For Something the report else. for studying how it'll That's arrive right. into H, how That's HS2 right. arrive into Leeds. It was like, uh, yeah, yeah, they did that. It's called HS2. It, yeah, done and it. then it turns, but then it turns out that both of those things have to come out of the same hundred million pound pot. Yep. And it was like Tracy, it was like the straw that broke the camel's back. Yeah. Tracy Brady was just going absolutely. She went, nuts. she went, yeah, yeah. She did not hold back. She just went absolutely <laughs> no, wild. Not at all. Yeah, yeah, yeah. For not sure. And all. rightly so, because it's yeah. just exact. And, and it's worth saying that's not a promise that there's going to be a West, a, 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 no. a tram or a metro system in Leeds. It's just yet another study, which there's yeah. been plenty of those. There's been loads of them. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Just Absolutely. build it. Yeah, no. Leeds has needed a metro system, and it's like it's it's like uh, we've gone off on one on a totally different trip. But it's in, the, one of the things that Britain is worst at in, ter in terms of our rail network. The thing we are worst at is suburban rail connections. We've got yeah. great long distance services, relatively speaking. We've got pretty good rural services, actually, like proper rural. I don't mean suburban rural. I mean like actual the fact that we have train rural, services rural, up to rural. Wick and stuff. They're not yeah, bad. Yeah, yeah. They're not actually bad. It's the suburban stuff that's dreadful particularly if you compare us to mainland Europe, you know, Germany, places like this that have, you know, cities the size of Manchester and Greater Manchester. And indeed, really, the whole of the north should be one large interconnected urban area. And this was the point of Northern Powerhouse Rail. It actually enabled that, not because of the trains on Northern Powerhouse Rail, but because of what it let the existing network become, which yeah. is what is, is proper, you know, suburban rail systems, a bit like Thameslink in Manchester, in Leeds. But also these cities merit an underground system, you know, these are huge cities. Manchester is an incredibly big, dense, massive, built-up city with blinking skyscrapers and stuff. Why doesn't it have a subway system? You know, well, like, what? I mean, you know, you then get onto this whole argument about why they won't pay to put Piccadilly underground when they redo it for HS2 at NPR. And it's like, oh, well, you know, prime development land in Manchester, we're just not going to kind of factor that in. Yeah. We're not going to factor in the blight in neighbouring communities that's going to be caused by having to bring it all in or massive viaducts. We're not going to kind of think about that at all. We're not going to think about future-proofing it. We're not going to think about what happens next because if you put it underground, that would mean that your next extensions within and beyond Manchester could go underground. You yeah. wouldn't have to disrupt the whole of the city centre and on and on yeah. and on, yeah. you know? So and that, have had enough of, of elevated dead end infrastructure. Like just yeah. walk under the Trafford Way to see what that looks yes. like. <laughs> well, I mean, you know, this is stuff that actually we're trying to get away from in many respects. Yeah. Stuff that goes back to the kind of mid to late twentieth century that kind of blighted communities then. I mean, I remember people saying to me when they kind of when they started to understand what this was going to mean for the areas kind mm. of around that east bit of Manchester around Piccadilly. Yeah. You kind of effectively kind of box whole areas in and you look at what some of the worst urban planning has done in this country in the last kind of since the war. And you can just see what's coming down just the line repeat. as a result. It's just a repeat. Absolutely. It's absolutely. just a repeat. Yeah. Just absolutely dreadful. But it is made by people who work off spreadsheets that don't actually understand the places that they're talking about and you're kind of you're back to leveling up really aren't you yeah exactly back to the analysis yeah. back to the government's own analysis in the middle Indeed. bit of the leveling yeah. up report yeah. yeah oh crikey it is exasperating jennifer thank you so much for being exasperated with me on this one it's you been really welcome. useful to have your insights into the kind of what the feeling is on the ground um and kind of an, an interpretation from a from a Mancunian perspective, I'm, I'm over here on in the comfortable east, you know, the correct side of the Pennines, and things do look slide. different. Yeah, it's, yeah, my hope is my hope is that it doesn't become a, a, an east-west battle again because it yeah. it, it has to be a unified. Like Burnham can't be like, well, I don't care too much about the eastern leg. He's got to understand that it's that it's all an all a necessary part. And it I, all yeah, the whole I thing. I did get the feeling going back a while actually that Manchester was kind of privately not really too fussed about yeah. the eastern leg of HS2, and it's like they they kind of do all really have to stay on the same page on that, and I yeah. think. You know, the, the the government in some ways has created a bit of a monster because it now has a Labour mayor. I mean, if you take Merseyside out of the equation to some extent, because, uh, you know, it didn't look like the government was ever really going to give them yeah, yeah, yeah. that. But South Yorkshire, West Yorkshire, Greater Manchester have the ability to shout for kind of like that bit 
that has kind of lost out from the key bit, key things yeah. that they were supposed to get out of the high, high speed rail thing, which is which is what we're seeing with this argument at the moment about the leveling up assessment. Um, but um, but 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 that to, that's your point about kind of being on the same page. Like that kind of creates a bit of a counterweight, political counterweight, yeah. um, that that ideally sort of stops those different places being being sort of picked up, picked off from one another. Yeah. yeah. Um, but um, I thought, yeah, yeah. I thought, I, I thought, I'm not a hundred percent set on on this, but I, I thought the appointment of McLaughlin wasn't necessarily a. It, it was quite a canny move by Transport for the North, having been stripped of a lot of power. They get uh, they they put in an essentially conservative voice to lead the shouting government. That didn't feel like necessarily that crazy an idea. It felt like like that potentially could have been a good move. We'll see. We'll see what happens. We'll but see. Yeah, yeah. It, we'll it see. Could be. Yeah. Like blue on blue action is. Um. Yeah. Is. Uh, I'm all for it. Anyway, so. Uh, let's look. Okay, let's let's wrap it up. So, uh, thanks to all the audio only listening people. Um, uh, this actually is probably this is probably the most normally podcast we've done in ages. It's just you know two people having a discussion without too many <laughs> without too many things going on on screen that don't make any sense uh, apart from my diagram bit. You'll have to refer. To I liked your diagram. Your diagram was good. <laughs> yeah. Um, so yeah. Though thanks thanks. Uh, this this is available on all podcasting platforms as well as going out as a video on the YouTube, of course. Um, the usual plugs, uh, patreon.com slash Gareth Dennis uh, is where you can go to support this, to make more of it happen, or um, or to tell me that you hate it and you want it to change. You can do that <laughs> if you give me money. I have to listen to your opinion. Uh, there is, weirdly, uh, I'm a track design engineer and there is merchandise for the podcast I do. Very bizarre. Uh, but feel free to go and get that and then send me a selfie on Twitter with your mask on or whatever. Um, PayPal.me slash Gareth Dennis for loose change and abuse. And garethdens.co.uk slash Discord if you want to continue the chat uh, that's been happening in the YouTube. Hello, everyone in the chat. Sorry, we've not been responding, but it's not live. So uh, I don't know what you're saying. Um, the Manchester Evening News has just appeared in, in, in a large, in large uh, yellow form. Um, Jen, do you write for the Manchester Evening News? And um, I, along with the Yorkshire Post and other northern kind of titles, it feels a bit like I was worried about regional and local democracy. And I still am to an extent, but it feels like there's been a bit of a resurgence in 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 regional and, and local journalism, and therefore you know that that's an, a critical part of democracy. And it feels like there's been a bit of a resurgence with it in the last sort of few years. I don't know. It's it's, it's great. Well, we've had plenty of things to shout at. So yeah. um, my plug is uh, go to the Manchester Evening News website. We have a website. Go to it. Read it. Buy the paper. Yeah, it's as simple as that. Buy the paper. Mm -hmm. uh, look at uh, see the adverts. Um, and and therefore uh, provide a bit of revenue for the Manchester Evening News so that it can continue Indeed. to pay good journalists. Um, yes. That's, it's what it's all about. The journal yes. Local journalism and regional journalism are an absolutely critical part of democracy. Democracy does not exist without journalism, so uh, go and support it. Um, oh, and also, you've got another plug, because uh, uh -huh. the Northern Agenda is a thing. Uh, shout out to Rob. Hi, Rob. Hi, Rob. Yes, it's our uh, 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 newsletter, morning newsletter. We also have a podcast that goes with it all run and curated and presented and written by my colleague uh, Rob Parsons, ex of the Yorkshire Post, <laughs> uh, and that kind of pulls together all of the big stories, the big sort of, uh, big sort of substantial policy, politics, that kind of thing, stories from across the north uh, each morning. So you can go and sign, you can sign up to that via our, our website, uh, or if you stick Northern Agenda into Google, you will be able to find it. Perfect. Thanks so much. And... Uh, next week, oh, we're escaping the misery of the in uh, the integrated rail plan and um, betrayals of of the north, and um, by looking at something that's very cheery, which is uh, our oncoming doom via climate change. Um, we're going to be going through. We're going to. It's a classic page turn. Everyone, we haven't done one of these for a while. Uh, we're going to go through a page turn through Network Rail's third climate adaptation report, which is actually quite an interesting piece. Lots of statistics, lots of data, looking at how climate change is impacting on the railways now and what Network Rail are doing about it, and how well they're doing on how they say they're doing about it. I, I think this should be quite an interesting one. I'm looking forward to it. Mm. Um, uh, yeah, it should be interesting. Oh, mm. Jen. Thanks so much. That's it. We've managed it. Okay, one minute and uh, one hour and three four minutes. So not quite the hour, but it's better than I normally am, frankly. That's okay. <laughs> you can always cut out some of my waffle. This, well, yeah, I might. I, I, I'll, I'll go through and all the bits where I go mm, and, uh, and and like spend time scribbling on things. I, I can clip this out. No, it's uh, that's that's been great. That's been really good. Um, I'm gonna let you have your evening back, but uh, yeah, that's been brilliant. Thanks so much. Um, it yeah, only really remains uh, for me to say to everyone in the to everyone in the in the chat. Oh. 
So it only remains for us. There's been a ch an edit there, so you can all enjoy that, everyone. Uh, it only remains for me to say uh, cheerio and for us to say to say goodbye. Cheerio, everyone. Cheerio. Bye. Bye. Bye.